little bit. What's important here is that trust is the most important element of any relationship, but especially a business relationship. So what we're going to talk about today is how to establish and maintain trust with your customers, because that's what's key. So the things I'm going to say may sound like common sense, and they really should be. But the one thing that I know from my 20 year, years in business is my, my leads, my clients, my customers are all 100% referral. And when I get a call, most of the time, the first sentence out of a, a prospect's mouth is this. Hey, Steve, we need your help. Our other developer dropped the ball. Those are the calls I get. <clears throat> When I speak to people outside of our industry and I tell them what I do, the reaction is normally this. Oh, I have a website project that's not going very well right now. These are real things. These are real perceptions. And unfortunately, developers are not seen as trusted resources. So while these things that I'm about to say may seem like common sense, they're not practiced. So I do hope you take some of these things to heart. I want you to keep something in mind. Our customers are trusting us with their hard-earned cash. I'm going to say that again. Our customers trust us with their hard-earned cash. Now notice I didn't say it this way. We deserve to be paid for our work. I also didn't say our customers need us more than they need that than they need us more than we need them. And those things are important because those are the attitudes I see over and over and over again coming from the developer community. And it's unfortunate. And what I'd like you to do while talking about some of these things is try to just change your frame of reference. I think those things all the time. I'm, I'm just as guilty of think thinking those things. Right? But if you change your frame of reference, it's going to change how you are around your customers and your prospects. One other thing, trust is earned. There's no way to make somebody trust you. And it's a process. And it's hard. And it takes time. And it happens over a long period of time. While it takes time to earn trust, it can be broken in a microsecond. And so you should treat trust like it's your baby. It's that fragile. And so, first thing I want to talk about is why trust is established right at the beginning of the relationship, right when you meet somebody. By the way, don't judge a book by its cover. It's probably the most ridiculous idiom of all the idioms, <laughs> right? Everybody judges everybody. That's what we do. You're judging me right now. Uh, well, I can see uh, in your uh, eyes. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, uh, that's terrible. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> That watch. One thing, <laughs> one thing I, try, I really try to do is I'm aware of my surroundings at all times. I'm aware of my environment. I'm aware of how people are perceiving me. That's, that's just something I try to focus on. So, knowing that, these are, some of, these are some of the things to pay close attention to when you're meeting somebody. Prospect, client, friend, networking event anything. Appearance. I know this sounds basic, but appearance matters. Again, you're judging me right now, <laughs> but I'm wearing a collared shirt. I shaved today. I smell decent. <laughs> smell the Scratch that last one. <laughs> <laughs> you're clearly not a developer. <laughs> <laughs> but appearance does matter. Right? And these things do lead to relationships, and these things do lead to trust. Respect. Treat others how you want to be treated. And again, in its most basic form, one thing you should focus on is manners. My mom used to say, she was my grandmother used to say, please and thank you, they matter. Any questions so far?
I know these sound like basics. Now we're getting a little bit more deep. Engagement. So when you meet somebody, make eye contact. Don't be the person on your phone when you're having a conversation, especially in an event like this. If you're at a networking event, if you're at a meetup, if you're at a word camp, if you're outside at the after party, put your phone away. There's a game I like to play with my friends, and maybe you guys, maybe some of you have played this. So when you're at a dinner, we call it phone stacking. Put your phone in the middle of the table, right? Stack them up. First person to reach for their phone, it pays the bill. All right. And it's important because without my phone, I'm engaged with in, in the uh, conversation. I'm present. And so I don't trust somebody who I'm talking to that is really only half there when, when we're having the conversation. So put your phone away. What's that? I was just taking <laughs> I wasn't looking at you, but since you put it in. Confidence. We talked, somebody mentioned this, you know, as to why I'm standing up here, right? Confidence is important. Now, confidence is not arrogance. There's a difference. I don't trust people who are cocky. I don't trust people who are arrogant. But I do trust people who are confident in what they're saying and what they're telling me. Because that says to me, they're confident in the knowledge that they have, in their experience, in their reputation. So confidence is key. But be careful. Only be confident about the things that you know. Don't try to be confident about something you don't know. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Familiarity. Right? There's a reason I speak at work camps. I want my name out there. I want my company name out there. So even if we've never met each other, hopefully the goal is, after I've spoken at enough word camps, or participated in enough podcasts, or led enough meetups, or gone to enough networking events, that my name is familiar. So you've either heard my name, or you've heard my company name when I introduce myself. That's an instant, that instantly fosters trust. So, we've heard it a lot today. I heard it in Shada's talk. Get involved. I heard it in, we've heard it in Ben's talk. I've heard it in several talks. That's been the theme. Get involved. Okay? Now, the theme in the other talks has been get involved to give back to the community, and I absolutely believe that. It's important. But there's a flip side to that, right? You can have selfish reasons for getting involved. It gets your name out there. It's part of how you do business. It's part of what again, encourages that, that familiarity. So it's important. And it's not selfish. This goes hand in hand with familiarity, reputation, right? But it's a little bit different. To me, reputation means I've never screwed anybody over. I have a good track record of delivering on time and on budget. My clients enjoy working with me. So, Yes, that there's some familiarity there, but reputation is really about how you carry yourself in a business engagement. So reputation is important and as important as familiarity. So once you start doing work, do a good job. Stay on top of things. One of the things my dad always told me when I was a kid, my dad's, my, I got most of, of my business acumen from my dad. One of the things he always said, Never burn a bridge. And we'll talk about that a little bit further, a little bit later on. And then, the last thing when it comes to um, meeting somebody and instilling trust is commonality, right? So I trust people that I have something in common with. And that just means we can have a conversation. We have like values, right? We can talk about something specific. Right? So we can have, we, we can relate on, on something. I understand my area of ex, uh, uh, areas of expertise, and I understand them well. And some of them are, and I listed them, technology, WordPress, mobile apps. Those are the things that I can speak about in the technology space. Outside of the technology space, I enjoy music, movies, 1980s pop culture references, basketball, go Clippers. CrossFit, which is new to me, I just started, and poker. 
And I'm pausing on this last one because it's a weird one. Because I'm giving a talk about trust, <laughs> but I'm talking about an activity where lying is an important part of strategy. <laughs> However, there is a poker community. And there's communities for all of these things, right? So we're in a WordPress community. We go to a WordCamp. There are poker communities. So even though poker is a game of lying, away from the poker table, I know lots of, I have lots of friends that are my poker buddies. And those are guys I trust inherently, right? At the table, we're fierce and we are deceiving each other. <laughs> but that's okay. Questions? All right. So that's how to establish trust from the beginning. However, once you've gained someone's trust, it constantly needs to be maintained. So it, just, it doesn't just happen, get established, and then you stop. It's something you always need to pay attention to, especially in a customer relationship. So what qualities help foster trust in your customers? And this is as you're working. So as you've engaged your, your, your customer or your client, These are things that help you maintain. Number one, and this is by far probably the leading thing of all the things I'm about to list out, consistency. If you can be consistent in what you do, your customers will trust you and will bring you more work. If you are inconsistent, you will break that trust. So at Zeek, we have a very specific process of how we work. It's an agile process. Um, we use it with every single client. It's a, the way we communicate. It's the way we roll out code. It's the way we track our bugs. It, it's just we have a very specific process. And we do educate our new customers as to how that process works. But once they get used to that process, it sticks. It stays. And it's consistent. And what's important about that is it's something they can count on. So if you do not have a process, I encourage you to create one and stick to it. Now, that's not to say that you have to be rigid. A process can be adapted over time. So there are parts of processes that don't work. Make those changes. But as you make those changes, you need to educate your customer, this is the change to the process, and this is how we're going to this is how we're going to work moving forward. Make sense? Just as important, punctuality. For God's sakes, deliver on time. I cannot say this enough. At the beginning of this talk, I talked about the kind of prospects I get and what people call me with. And nine times out of 10, it's because the developer missed a timeline. Now, I'm not perfect, and neither is my team. And we miss timelines all the time. What's different is, when a timeline is going to be missed, I communicate that early. As soon as we know that something's going to be delayed, we let the client know. And here's what's important, is most of the delays, even the ones that I get called about from a different developer, were caused by the client. So even the trust that was broken was out of the developer's control. However, Everything I'm talking about, trust, respect, all that stuff, doesn't mean you're a doormat. So if a client is going to delay, it, or causes a delay, communicate that back to the client. And say, listen, you've asked me to deliver on this date. You've caused a delay for this reason. How would you like to deal with that? And do it as soon as you know. So Steve, do you predict that in a contract or some, somehow before you start working with them? Let me save that to the end. Hang on to that question. I will take questions at the end. Thank you. Um, passion. I'm passionate about my work. I'm passionate about my client's work. I truly am. When I first wrote this slide, I wrote the word enthusiasm. But that's different than passion. Enthusiasm says, I'm going to be positive about your project at all times. 
That's not true. I'm not going to be positive about your project at all times. That's not authentic. And sometimes I'm going to be unhappy. Right? Or you're going to make a decision that I don't agree with. But I will let you know because I'm passionate about it. So passion is not positive or negative. It just says, I'm, I'm just as excited about this as you are, and I want to deliver a quality product. And you can count on me to be passionate for you. So that's going to instill a lot of trust. Honesty. Me too. <laughs> Glad that slide showed up. <laughs> Big time. We've touched on this a little bit during this presentation, but this is, this is very important in a client or customer relationship. I let all my customers know we're going to be 100% transparent from the get-go. If we screw up, we're going to let you know. If you screw up, we're going to let you know. If something gets screwed up, we're going to let you know. We're going to let you know what happened, we're going to let you know what we did about it, and we're going to move on with our day. That's how we're transparent. Okay? And that, what I just described goes hand in hand with transparency. If you're honest and then you don't have any follow-up or a resolution, that's no good. So transparency is important, but you have to have a plan to go along with it. Humility. There's a phrase, a few phrases I'm going to give you in the next section that I, I actually want you to work into your vocabulary. And here's the most important one with humility. I touched upon it a little bit earlier. Practice this phrase. I don't know. That makes you human. I don't know everything. I truly don't. And when somebody asks me a question that I don't know, I respond, I don't know. I'll go find the answer. I'm resourceful. I'll get you an answer. But I don't know. And that's OK. Your clients, your customers do not expect you to know everything. So I don't know is a really good phrase to work into your vocabulary. And that's OK to be human. It's OK not to know everything. And again, I wrote this note. No one likes arrogance. So the opposite of this is, I'm going to make up an answer. That's arrogant. And ultimately, that's a lie. And you're going to get caught. And you're going to break that trust. <clears throat> I take responsibility for all aspects of the project. And I've talked about this in other talks. I even take responsibility for things I don't cause. When you become my customer, I'm 100% responsible for all aspects, even if we're working with other vendors. So the other phrase I wrote is, I take full responsibility for my actions. And what that means is if a client calls me and yells at me for something, I'll take responsibility for my part. And that's OK. And I'll even take responsibility for somebody else's part, and I'll go make it, I'll go fix it. But again, it's just instilling trust. And the last one is empathy. And this is the thing that's missing out of the developer community. Present company excluded, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Do your best to put yourself in your customer's shoes, right? They don't know technology. They don't understand what we're doing. To them, everything we do is the, the wizard behind the curtain. That's how they see us. So when something goes wrong, think about their point of view and empathize. Don't be so rigid. As soon as you do that, You've broken trust and probably will get fired. So have some empathy. And part of empathy, I think, is flexibility. So when a client calls, or when a customer calls, or when anybody calls and says, I want this, and your first reaction is, 
That's ridiculous. <laughs> Do your best to change that frame of reference. And think outside the box. And, and, and again, ask the question, why is this request coming in? What is their business goal? And be a little bit more flexible. This is how I keep my clients. This is how I keep their trust. This is how I maintain it. So what happens when you break it? And what happens when you lose it? Howard Dean screamed on a malfunctioning mic when he had been on the campaign trail for months. And he was hoarse. And so it came out sounding like a crazy man. That's what happened. But he was never able to recover. And he dropped out of the race soon after that. It just happened. There's going to be things that are outside of your control. So the best thing you can do when trust is broken or when you lose it is ask questions. That's the first thing I do. Ask questions. And one of the best questions you can ask when you get fired or don't get any more work from a client is this. What can I do to earn your business back? Listen to that question for a second. It's not arrogant. I didn't say anything about I deserve your business because we've been working for a long time together. right? What I'm saying to my customer is you're an important customer to me. To me right? I want to work to earn your business back or to earn your trust back. I'm recognizing that statement that trust is earned and business is earned. So try asking that question if something goes wrong with a client. If a small problem ha happens and you haven't been fired, or something's happening and you're in trouble, the first thing I do is I say, I will do everything in my power to make it right. I have your back. Again, these are simple statements that just let your client know, you can trust me, I realize we screwed up, we'll go fix it. Bless you. The thing I like to do when I'm asking questions, or that I'm trying to do, is the first thing is I'm trying to identify if trust is actually an issue, right? Does my client actually not trust me anymore, right? It may just be my perception that I haven't gotten any new work, so I've, I've lost trust. But the reality is maybe they just don't have any new work for me. Maybe somebody else new has come in and they've brought in their own vendor which happens to me all the time, right? Doesn't mean I did a bad job, doesn't mean I broke trust. I'm asking those questions so that I can figure out if my perception is reality. If my perception is reality and trust has been broken, the questions I'm gonna ask about are, what was the event? Where was trust broken? And at that point, I'm gonna try to isolate that event. If this is a client I've been working with for a long time, and there was one event that changed our complete perception and broke our credibility, I'm gonna do my best to isolate that event, take responsibility for it, right, and see if trust can be restored. But if you can isolate that event and separate it out as a very sort of matter-of-fact issue, you can minimize it. And I don't know what that event is, but I am gonna go over a few examples of what events might be. So let me tell you about a couple of recent things that happened this past week. I have a long-term client, a client I've been working with for seven years, very large site. And this past Thursday, we pushed some code and it broke their social bar, their social sharing piece of their, of their website. I got an email yesterday morning titled WTF man from my, my contact with this client. My response back was go after yourself. No, 
<laughs> My response back was, client, I'm not familiar with what's going on, but I'm going to go and familiarize myself right now. I assure you, this is all hands on deck, and we will get to the bottom of this immediately. I have your back. That was my response. Now we went and we did our due diligence, and we spent about three hours with four people. Again, all hands on deck. And while we were investigating the problem, we sent updates to the client. This is what we've found so far. We're still investigating these things. This is what we found so far. We're still investigating these things. Ultimately, what we found was it wasn't our fault at all. Never is. Never is. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm just kidding. It, it, it is a lot. <laughs> but it is time. Was it wasn't our fault at all. Okay? So my developer pushed some code. The code that was supposed to get pushed went. The code that was then was supposed to get rolled out to the servers got rolled out to the servers. And something happened on the CDN that just didn't take our code. Once we push, with this particular client, once we push the code, it's out of our hands. So my final email back to the client was, listen, this is what happened, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a system of checks and balances in place to make sure that even if that occurs in the future, we're gonna take full responsibility for it. And so, when they do cold rollouts from now on, I'm having somebody stay late to check their process to make sure our code works. I take responsibility for that, even though it's out of my hands. Now, I could have said, that's a YP, a your problem. But I'm not going to do that, because this is a client that has trusted me for seven years. And I'm not going to break that. That's fragile. A whole different situation happened this week, right? Um, client had an outstanding invoice, okay? We discussed some terms, we actually revised some terms where we don't get paid until a certain piece gets launched. Wasn't how it was in the original contract, but that's okay. We made that deal. Now the client delayed us. And so I couldn't get paid. Anybody have this happen to them? This never happens. <laughs> never happens, right? So what I did is I called the client and I said, pay right now or I'm taking your site down. No, I didn't do that <laughs> Don't tweet that. <laughs> I called the client and I said, listen, this is the situation. You asked me to, take, to change the terms and I did. And now we're experiencing, uh, we're experiencing a delay. What would you like to do? And I'm able to have that conversation because, again, we've established a trust with this client over the past six months. If you've established that trust and if you haven't, those are easy conversations. If you don't, that conversation's not going to go well. So the client said, oh, you know what? I caused you a delay, I'm going to go ahead and release payment. I, I, my bad. But again, I didn't call him threatened. It was not a bad conversation. I simply asked a question. So let me show you one other thing that I saw on Facebook this week. <laughs> a good project manager knows when to kill a project. It's been many years, and for the first time, I had no choice but to pull the plug. I have never dealt with such a difficult and verbally abusive client. It was really eye-opening. The lesson, stick to your contracts. And to be perfectly blunt, it's not about what the client wants. It's about what they can afford and what they have agreed to on a signed piece of paper. I do, however, feel bad for the next company that gets this guy. He will leave a trail of disaster and many enemies. <laughs> now, on to bigger and better things. Good luck, asshole. Ooh, that's a burnt bridge. <laughs> that's a burnt bridge. Thank you. John, I'm sorry to post your video. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. I blurred you out. 
That was not John Hawkins. <laughs> it was the other John. So, <laughs> let's talk about this for a second, right? These things that I'm explaining matter even after you get fired, or after you've severed the relationship, or after you've quit. It doesn't matter if this is not your client anymore. And let me tell you why. Do you think I'm gonna hire this guy as a project manager if he comes to me and wants a job? Makes me want to help the guy who got rid of him. Absolutely, that was my first reaction. I almost hit comment and said, send him my way. Right. <laughs> Because I can make a hero out of this guy. Yeah. I agree. Don't do this. <laughs> and I get frustrated. I'm a, like I said, I'm a passionate guy, right? I get emotional. I don't like getting fired. I don't like when relationships end. It's not a comfortable situation. But you know what I do? I go curl up in the fetal position and cry. <laughs> Um, I go, I go, and nowadays, I go work out, or I go do something else. But the first thing I do is I just get away from the computer, right? If I, I, again, like I said, I'm very aware of my surroundings, and I try to be very in tune with my emotional state. So if something happens that I don't like, the first thing I do is I go take a walk, get away from the computer. The keyboard is your enemy at that point, right? This is not the place to take it out. Take a walk, call a friend, call your wife or, or husband, right? Vent elsewhere, and it's okay, to, I'm not saying don't vent, right? Go, but vent elsewhere, privately, and then act like a human being, and practice some respect. I'm Steve Zengit, my company is Zeke Interactive, and now I guess we will open it up to questions. Thank you. Is there a question up here that you wanted to ask a second ago? Yeah. If you, if you handle doubling the contract, like uh, if there are delays on the client side on your side. So, sorry, I had to cut you off. No, go ahead. Let's talk about contracts for a second, okay? Contracts are important. Don't get me wrong, I've talked a lot about contracts. I've talked a lot about language, right? Once the contract is signed, it is important to stick to the scope of the contract, to, to the letter of the contract, the scope of the work. That is your agreement. But no contract I've ever had has stayed 100% true, is never 100% matched the, the course of the project. So that's where you need to be flexible. And if something changes during the course of the project that doesn't match the contract, it's your job to verbalize that with the client as soon as possible. And it can, the way I do that is, again, I ask a question, right? Those are not always comfortable conversations, but I ask it like this. Hey, you know what? I, I, I was reviewing the scope, and now we've experienced a change. How would you like to deal with that? And then just listen. And react. Does that answer your question? Sure. So contracts are contracts don't have to be oh, so rigid. One of the um, techniques that I use in a similar situation like that is I also communicate the, the change with the client. And I will oftentimes formulate a couple of scenarios for options to give them to choose from, too, that remain within the boundaries that I have set for my own business as well. And you use an important word, boundaries. Yes. Okay? And, and, and I didn't talk about that here because this talk was about trust, but boundaries are key. So you should know what your boundaries are right. so that you know when they've been broken. If you don't know what your boundaries are, then that's a gray area to you. Yeah. You notice I'm not calling on John Hawkins. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel? Uh, first of all, you have your set prices. How do you deal with stating them to the client and having them respect those prices? Like sometimes you get those. You know, it's usually you get what you pay for, and sometimes clients do not want to pay what you evaluate yourself as, as or your services. So I think the question is, um, how do I communicate my pricing to the client? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like this. 
this is my price. <laughs> <laughs> Could you do that again, please? Yeah. <laughs> Write it down. This is my price. <laughs> and here's why. Okay? Here's, here is my price to do this project. Right? I say it very confidently. Right? This is the price. And at that point, I've gone through a lot. Before I get to price, I've gone through a lot of scoping conversations. So it's not just, let me hear your project and here's my price, right? So it goes through a lot of conversations, here's the price, right? At that point, it's on the, it's on the customer to say yes or no. And they'll tell me yes or no, right? Or I may not hear from them. And then I call back and I say, hey, I sent you the price, how do you feel? What are you feeling? Again, don't try to guess what they're going to say. That you help answer your question? John Hawkins. So, <laughs> <laughs> you, um, you talk a lot about uh, like when, when something goes wrong and, and you get that response, you know, you get, you get that WTF dude uh, email. Um, that client obviously you've been working with for seven years. But let's talk about something you haven't been working with for seven years. And you're just getting these emails that are WTF dude at the smallest thing. The problems are not your problems. Yes, you're taking ownership, and that's awesome. But how much are you putting into that little bucket of asshole tax that where it gets to the point where you go, <laughs> you filled like, up your asshole tax, and I'm now going to dump all of that out and dump you out with it? Like, okay. How do you how do you kind of balance? So that? the question is the question is um, with a newer client. Right? How do you deal with a a WTF dude email? Right? Not hey, just one. Though. I got it's not it. just one. It's every you know. I get it. I get it. I treat them as uh, education opportunities. Right? So the first one I get, I will I will call or better yet have a face to face meeting with the client and say, listen. Obviously, and here's how you take ownership. Right? I may not have explained this part of the process fully. So let's, let's go over this part of the process so you understand. Right? Explain it and say, moving forward, or at that point you ask, is there anything else I can help explain? You know, is there anything else that's a gray area for you? Right? Second one that happens, okay, if it's the same thing, at that point you've got a change order education meeting. Right? So you can go in and say, listen, just want to let you know, I explained the process. This happened again, right? And at this point, I'm starting to incur extra time that I wasn't anticipating. Right? I just want to let you know. Here's how we deal with extra time. Maybe it's in your contract. So here's how we scoped out extra time in the contract. Just want to let you know what this, what this looks like. Right? So I'm more than happy to field these emails and field these questions or take on this extra work. I'm happy to do that. But it comes with a price. And so are you okay with that? They may be fine. They need it, may, you may find out they're the kind of person who just wants to talk. And that comes with a price because you're incurring time as a, as a result. So that's a matter of just managing expectations right up front. But you got to do that stuff at the first go around. And then the third time? At the third time, then they've they've run out of their asshole, whatever, however John put it. No, I'm just I'm joking. I'm joking. At the third time, at the third, at third, if it's the third time after you've had that conversation two times, at that point you can get a little bit more firm and say, I just want to let you know, we we had these two meetings, we discussed this, and, and now I have to charge. So just want to let you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna send you a bill this month for an extra three hours because I had to deal with this thing. That's fine. Yeah, I, uh, the talking thing. I I worked for an agency and they would send me there to the difficult people because I get along with difficult people because I don't really I don't really know when people are insulting me. My friends is, my friends insult me all the time. I've just become immune. <laughs> the, the talking thing is so true. I, this one guy he, he just always had all these changes and uh, would take up so much time and all the developers would hate working with this guy. And, uh, and I just I just started out in the blue, and I said, you you know, you realize, I mean, these, these conversations take up time. Like, would you pay for them? And he's like, yeah, yeah, no, I thought we were on the clock. 
And uh, I became best friends with this guy. Absolutely. <laughs> And you said something important, and we've, I've talked about this in talks that I've given with Chris Lemma and Kareem and, and, and those guys at, at Business Talks, right? Um, and now I've lost my train of thought. Um, uh, it's, back it's, yeah, talk to me. Being on the clock. Um, it was about um, uh, uh, change orders. Um, give me a second. I'm, I'm still sick, so. Um, It'll come back to me. Give me, give me one second. Let me take another question. It'll come back to me. Yep. Oh, um, oh go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this on the high well, I was just going to remark, you know, you talked a couple times about educating clients about process, but sometimes part of trust building is educating the clients about the technology pieces. Uh -huh. Sometimes they assume that something is really simple to put together and it's actually really complicated, mm -hmm. or the opposite. And you build trust when you... You know, when you're honest and, and educate the client about those things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I remember what I was going to say. What I was going to say was um, I always encourage fellow developers to change their frame of reference around change orders and scope adjustments. And one of the things I've said in the past is take the word change order out of your vocabulary, right? It's got a negative connotation to it. We call it scope adjustments. So we call it Z. It's the same thing. Right? It's just got a, it's, it sounds a little bit more friendly, right? <laughs> but if you change your fra frame of reference, because you said something important, developers, you said developers hate working with this client because he's always making changes, right? What I tell my team is change orders are good. Changes are awesome. We want changes as long as we can build for them, right? <laughs> That's the key. If you're taking change orders and you're not billing for them, then they're bad. But if the frame of reference is, we can charge for all this time, why wouldn't we take changes, right? It's how we all get paid. Your whole team should be on board with that. Change orders are good. There's another question over here, yeah? So I was uh, wondering about pricing. I know a few years back you had a price sheet and you put it up on the screen for uh -huh. everybody to see. Do you still have that or yeah. do you wait to talk about price until you've built that trust? No, if somebody asked me my rate card, I, I'll, I'll email to them. Okay. Usually with the phrase, hourly rates aren't everything, right? It, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean everything. So we really should have a scoping conversation before we discuss hourly rates. But if you want to know how we calculate the project, these, these are our, our hourly rates. Is there a, yeah. Okay. Uh, I was just curious, when you do get to the end of the road with a client where you've done everything you can to work with them and there just isn't a fit, do you... If they're a difficult client, we won't use the A word. If they're a difficult client, do you refer them, or do you just to not John? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I, I actually give them all to Alex Vasquez. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so the question was, do I refer a difficult client? Yes. Somebody and that's a that's a delicate balance, right? Yeah, because I, I trust my friends, <laughs> right? And I, and I trust my colleagues a lot, and they trust me. So if I do have a client that I, that I need to pass on, right, that I just, I, I just can't work with anymore, and I, do, and I think there's somebody that might be a fit, I'll call that person first, and I'll explain, hey, this is a client that we can't work with anymore, and they were difficult for these reasons, so they're not the right fit for us. If you think they're the right fit for you, I'm happy to refer them, right? And at that point, that's that's on the that's on Alex if he's decided to take it on, <laughs> or John. Yeah. For those difficult Last conversations, question. Yeah. Last question. Do, you, yeah. do you think it's better to do it in person or over the phone, or can we do it on email? Great question. So the question is, for those difficult conversations, what's the best venue, right? Face to face. Number one, if you can get a face to face, always. And I've, I've, I've said this till I'm blue in the face. Face-to-face -face is it, okay? Second to that, video chat. Skype, Google Hangout, uh, I, I message, uh, FaceTime. Face, FaceTime, thank you. Video chat, right? Cause, cause, and the reason is when you're when you're face-to-face -face or you're on a video chat, you can see their actual emotion. You can see their, 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 their body language. That's what's important, right? Third to that is phone. Don't communicate over chat or email, it, especially in a difficult conversation. If you do have, a, uh, if there is a difficult conversation to have and you cannot reach your client, send an email, and a very brief email, and say, "Are you available to chat? I'd like to discuss these things." And leave it at that. We make it very matter of fact. I, I, 
take, take a minute. Are you available to chat? I'd like to discuss these things face to face. I think it's important that we meet face to face to discuss these things. All right. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.